I'm delighted to uh, welcome Franz Diwall, a primatologist and a biologist. Um, he is a professor emeritus at uh, Emory University, Atlanta. He has been working with different pillars of humanity and will discuss more about his work today. And um, he has written some amazing books, uh, Chimpanzee Politics, Mama's Last Hug. Um, so I welcome you, Franz. You're welcome. So, uh, just to start with the uh, with the uh, with your career, you've had an amazing career, starting as an observer, a primatologist, uh, watching Mama, Mama's la Mama's uh, colony, then moving on to going to the U.S., working with capuchin monkeys, you know, working with elephants, and writing Mama's Last Hug. So, so how do you how do you what do you think about your journey? How do you feel? I feel good about it. Uh, I, I think a journey like that is, is often put together by accidents. So uh, it, it's, not, it's not when I was a kid that I wanted to study chimpanzees. I, I was very interested in animals, for sure. Um, but um, through circumstances, I've ended up with uh, working with the, mostly, mostly with primates, with monkeys and apes. And, and the beauty of monkeys and apes is, of course, that um, comparison with humans is very easy because humans are primates. So it's very easy to make these comparisons. And so I write popular books that dwell on that. And, and, and writing as a popular author is, is not logical for every scientist. There's lots of scientists who never do that. Uh, but I, I was always attracted to communicating with a, with a general audience. Yes, indeed. Um, so today we'll so so in general, if you see in humanity uh, or in humans, we have that that sort of confusion, right? That all the values that we get, whether they are from culture or they are biological, means they are inherent to us. So this is what sort of we'll discuss today uh, for about mm -hmm. forty to forty-five minutes, and then we can take some questions from the audience as well. Um, okay. To, to start with uh, our uh, title of the talk today, uh, Humanity 2.0, Lessons from Our Cousins. So do you think, why, why should we study animals? You know, do, do you think there are lessons there for humanity? Yeah, I think there are big lessons because um, Western philosophy, for sure, but I think other philosophies, human philosophies as well, draw a sharp line between humans and animals, as if, as if humans are not animals, which is a silly statement uh, for a biologist. Humans are, of course, animals. We, we have DNA and lungs and hearts like everybody else. So um, uh, I, I see that as a, as a major flaw of Western philosophy to draw that line and to, to try to set us apart and say that we, our minds are certainly different, they would say, but even, even everything else about humans is certainly different. The, the current crisis, the, the pandemic, but also the climate crisis, I think are a product of that kind of thinking, is where we, where we think we can do anything we want with Earth. We, we, we are the boss here. There's even a book, The Masters of the Universe, and that's about humans. Uh, so we are the boss and we can do whatever we want. Th that's the attitude. And that's also in, in philosophy and in religion is often what is uh, promulgated, is that we can do whatever we want. We are the boss here. And uh, I think in my work, I try to emphasize that we, um, we are animals. Our mental capacities are very similar to those of other animals. We are definitely primates. If you look at human DNA, um, it's very close to chimpanzees and bonobos. Uh, it's a fact, uh, human DNA is as close to that of the chimpanzee as the two DNAs of African and Asian elephants are to each other. We call them both elephants. Uh, and so uh, it's extremely close. And so my, my task is to point out that we are animals among other animals. And I think Western philosophy has put us on this this disastrous path of saying that humans are not part of nature, humans are sort of outside of nature. Uh, and, and it has been a constant struggle. Of course, Darwin has been part of that struggle. There's a constant struggle for us biologists to say that we are, we are uh, a product of nature and part of nature. Indeed, I mean, that, that does make sense. But, uh, and I think that a lot of confusion also comes because of these complex values that we get. I mean, of course there is, this simple biology that there, is, there are 
there are genes dna and then you know that makes up this these organisms which are sitting there consciously talking about the same processes um and and to to go on from there to and take let's say the first thing that we we, we can talk about is rationality so what do you think uh, are we rational uh, are we rational beings are the like the other apes they are rational well we we have a lot of cognitive capacities that we share with other animals but i would not call a chimpanzee a rational being and i would not call humans a rational being humans are driven by emotions uh, the most important decisions we take in life let's say um, who you're going to marry this seems like an important decision to me is that a rational decision I, i don't think so it's an emotional decision so it's a body decision basically so um, we are rational beings to some degree but it is totally overrated i think what the, what the ratio do and, and if you look at the modern literature from psychology you notice probably that uh, intuitive pro- processes and emotional processes often have priority over these rational processes that we value so much and if we were truly rational we would not be doing to the planet what we're doing today and so um i think we are driven by a lot of emotions and uh and in that regard we are very similar to other primates i don't think we have emotions that they don't have in the other way around and rationally yes we have language i i consider that a very special capacity language is very important and is uniquely human so we have language but um basic rationality like looking ahead for example we do now a lot of experiments on animals can they look ahead can they plan for the future can they plan for tomorrow we do these experiments now with apes and with birds and yes animals can actually look ahead and and can make plans for the future and so that kind of rationality is not uniquely human we may be able to plan much further ahead like a couple of years i'm not sure we have evidence for that in other animals but uh, still um the basic capacity uh, can be found elsewhere hi nice. so there is um then again the next thing so if let's say that we are more driven uh, by emotions maybe less rational uh, then what is the uh, foundation of uh, let's 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 not talk about religion but we can talk about faith in general or to say about blind faith so what do you think yeah. the foundation of blind faith in humans or if there are also some studies or observations from apes yeah uh belief in the supernatural I- i'm not sure we have that evidence there there have been speculations about spirituality in other animals like in chimpanzees for example chimpanzees react to sudden weather events like a, a sudden downpour sometimes with dancing it's called a rain dance uh, and, and there's other observations of chimpanzees in the field doing ritualistic things that that we can't explain and, and we don't know why they do it and, and what it means so there have been speculations about spirituality in other animals uh but um human religion in 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 the sense of having specific supernatural phenomena that we believe in uh, i don't think exists so that that seems a uniquely human well if if you call it an advantage some have called it delusion of course <laughs> it seems like a specifically human delusion <laughs> uh, to believe yeah. in things yeah 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 and and uh so then your work like you you started working of course uh, uh with with primates and then you've done a lot of work on empathy on morality um so so what do you think the human mor- morality is it cultural or it's inherent yeah uh i started working on the evolution of morality when i discovered that that empathy exists among mammals especially in the, in the primates but i think in all the mammals and so i got interested in that because um uh chimpanzees for example they they if if someone is distressed and and has lost a fight or has fallen out of a tree or whatever the reason is they will go over there and embrace and kiss and and calm them down and so they reassure the distressed and bonobos will do the same thing often in a more sexual way bonobos are our closest relatives too like the chimpanzee 
And so uh, empathy responses, because in, in human children, this is called empathy, if they reassure a distressed individual. Uh, empathy responses have now been found in all the mammals and, and the rodent studies, the, the mice and rat studies on empathy. So when I discovered that empathy exists in, in species close to us, I of course immediately ran into the literature that claims that empathy and compassion are the core of uh, human morality. And uh, I, I live in a country in the US where many people believe that morality comes from God. So, so morality is, is handed down by God who tells us how to behave. Um, and that cannot be true in my opinion, in the sense that our current religions are a couple of thousand years old, two, three, four thousand years old, but our species is much older and, and primates are much, much older. And so if morality comes from basic emotions like empathy, as, as David Hume has always said, uh, the, the moral sentiments, then uh, morality is much older than the religions. And so morality precedes religion. Religion may play a role for sure. That's, that's very well possible. Um, so I got interested in that topic of the evolution of morality. I think human morality has a few special elements that we don't find in other primates. Uh, but as a whole, uh, being upset by injustice, for example, we do experiments on fairness in, in monkeys, uh, uh, empathy, following rules, social rules, and not accepting that someone violates the rules. All of these things can be found in the other primates. And so some of the basics of human morality, I call it, call it the building blocks we can find in other species. And then humans add some superstructure to it. Uh, which, which, which you could call the justification of these rules. Once, once we have designed the rules, we start to justify them and explain them and give reasons for them. And I don't think the primates, are, other primates are doing that. Yeah, um, you, you have some nice experiments with the reciprocity, reciprocity. So if you can, I don't know, define probably one of them, uh, it'll be interesting to know. Yeah, reciprocity is, is very much a part of primate society and reciprocity in humans is surrounded by morality because if you if I do you a big favor and you never return the favor and and you even refuse to do me a favor I, I will get very upset and that's a moral reaction because you you're supposed to return favors that you get so uh, human reciprocity is surrounded by moral rules and reciprocity is easily demonstrated in many of the primates. And so, for example, we, we have done studies where we, we look in the morning in the chimpanzees who grooms whom for how long. And then we give them food to share. And then we see who shares food with whom. And you can see that the ones who have been, if I have been grooming you, for example, you will be more likely to share food with me in the the afternoon and so we can we can demonstrate that we also do studies on fairness and so uh, the most famous experiment which is on the internet and has been seen 200 million times or something is a, an experiment with two monkeys side by side uh, and one monkey uh, they do a very simple task like we throw a rock into the enclosure and they have to give it back to us one monkey gets grapes and the other one gets cucumber now cucumber is normally a reward that they will work for. They, they think it's perfectly fine. But when the other one is getting grapes, they, they don't think it's fine anymore. And they get very upset and they refuse to work and all of these things. And so in, the, in these capuchin monkeys, um, there's a strong reaction to unfairness. And this reaction has now been demonstrated in a few other animals as well. And so animals who cooperate, social animals, they tend to watch what they get and, and they, will, they want to get for the same work, the same thing as everybody else. And so the, that, that is a strong tendency, which is relevant today with all the, all the worry about income inequality. And we have that same strong reaction and that's why we get very upset if, if some of these billionaires fly to the moon uh, and, and are proud of it. I mean, wasting money on that kind of stuff, we get very upset by that. Yeah, and, and what do you think, why it is important for all the social animals? Because I think for sure it'll exist in all the other uh, social societies as well. 
Yeah, so uh, it exists in dogs, which are cooperative hunters. They, they, they descend from cooperative hunting animals. It exists in capuchin monkeys and chimpanzees, who are also hunters. Um, we think it has something to do with intense cooperation. If let's take, let's take hunting. Let's say I go hunting with you regularly and you take all the meat. I get, I get only a few scraps. That means I need to start protesting against you or I need to look for a, bit, a better partner. I'm sure I can find a better partner who shares with me. And so I need to be sensitive to what I get out of the collective effort that we have made. That is where I think the sense of fairness comes in. And if you don't do that, you, you get exploited, of course. Then, then um, uh, that's pretty useless to be a cooperator in a system where you get nothing out of it. And so I think in these cooperative animals like chimpanzees and capuchin monkeys and dogs, there is a high sensitivity to uh, effort you put into the collective and, and the rewards you get out of it. Yeah, nice. So if we uh, now, since we are talking about hunters, maybe we can also talk about hierarchy. So you have uh, interesting um, uh, sort of comments and observations on hierarchy. Do hierarchies exist? Why, why do we need them in human society, for example? Hierarchies exist everywhere. You put a bunch of young puppies together, dogs, they will be, the first day, they will be fighting and, and establish a hierarchy. You put kids together in a daycare center, we've never seen each other, the first day is chaos, they will be battling with each other. Establishing a hierarchy is everywhere. And so I don't know why some people sometimes deny the tendency to form hierarchies or want to go against hierarchies or have the illusion that, for example, men are more hierarchical than women. You know, the, the, the word pecking order comes from hens, not from cocks. And, and all female animals have hierarchies, baboon females, chimp females, bonobo females. And, and in humans, if you ever look at an all-girls school or a, a nunnery or a female prison, uh, hierarchies are everywhere. That doesn't mean they're good or bad. I, I, I think they regulate competition. And so they avoid a lot of fighting because once a hierarchy is established, which may take a couple of days or a couple of weeks or whatever it takes, um, yeah, then uh, it reduces aggression and aggression goes down once it is established because there is a, each time you meet someone, you know where you are in the system, so to speak. Uh, so, so it is an unfair system you could look at it as, as unfair for, for the ones who are lower in the hierarchy, but it prevents a lot of chaos and a lot of uh, violence between individuals. So, so I'm not saying it's good or bad, but all social animals tend to form hierarchies. As soon as they recognize each other individually, there's even fish who form hierarchies if they recognize each other individually, uh, you get that kind of uh, arrangement. And, and what I, think is striking about hierarchies, and that is underestimated by people, is that the ones at the top have certain responsibilities. That's an interesting thing for me. So in chimpanzees, for example, the highest ranking male, who doesn't need to be the biggest male, because chimpanzees have a political system, there's a lot of coalitions, and so sometimes the smallest male is the alpha male. So the highest ranking male usually breaks up fights in the group, stops fights, and protects the underdog, protects the weak against the strong, and acts as a conciliator. He, he consoles individuals who have been uh, beaten up by somebody, or he protects them. And uh, so, he, so he has certain responsibilities. And if the male is good at this, a good leadership, he gets supported in his position. Then uh, as soon as there's a challenger coming, try to de dethrone him, uh, the, the whole group is going to support that alpha male because they want to keep him. If he's not a good alpha male, if, he, if he's a bully, because we have those too, if he's a bully who exploits everybody and, and terrorizes everybody, then as soon as there's a challenger, a couple of years later, uh, they're going to put their weight behind the challenger and he's going to be dethroned. And sometimes these males end very badly. That's, of course, known of humans, too. And, and so uh, we have bullies, too. And so not every leader is a good leader. And uh, we try to get rid of them at some point. Yeah, so, so you basically you already hinted at this, but 
then where does power lies in the hierarchies? Uh, if we just want to summarize the, the, the your observation. Well, power, power is derived from your connections. So, so you, a male can be physically dominant uh, because he's much stronger than anybody else. That doesn't mean he has the power. I've known older males who are not at the top anymore, who have more power than the alpha male. And I've known uh, Mama, this is the book that I wrote about Mama, the chimpanzee female, she had more power than almost any male that I know uh, because she was alpha female for 40 years. She had all the connections and any male who would go against her would get all, all the other females also against them because she could mobilize all the females basically. And so mama had an enormous power and, and often decided who would be the alpha male because she would put her weight behind a certain male. Uh, and so, yeah, then, then you get the question, if the position of the alpha male depends on the alpha female, who is the most more powerful of the two? Then that becomes the question. So he may be dominant and everyone may be bowing for him and all of this, but still, if, if mama withdraws her support, then he's in trouble. So, so that's an interesting question, what you call power. And I always like to make that distinction between power and dominance, because when people say primates are male dominated, I always think, well, you know, there's lots of females who have a ton of power in these groups. Yes. And of course, in this discussion, we need to include bonobos as well, where uh, these societies are different or elephants, for example. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can also elaborate on that. Uh, since we are in 21st century and basically the century of feminists. Uh, I think it's also uh, good to bring those examples from the nature where uh, matriarchs are also uh, leading the societies. Yeah, so bonobos are exactly equally close to us as chimps. The, the people often don't know much about bonobos uh, because chimpanzees were discovered first and, and uh, everyone has elaborated the connection with chimpanzees, but not with bonobos. But genetically, they're exactly equally close to us. Bonobos are female dominated. So the alpha female is not just the highest female, but it's the highest individual in the group. And uh, we have known this since the 90s, but uh, anthropologists never wanted to hear this. They didn't want to hear about bonobos. They, they put them aside. Because bonobos are peaceful, they don't wage war between groups, they mingle between groups. They, they, when, the, when the groups meet, they, they have sex and they groom and then the kids play together. It look, looks more like a picnic than like warfare. Um, so they're too peaceful, uh, so to speak, and the females are dominant. And so the anthropologists, since they have this whole narrative about human evolution where we we got where we are by eliminating everybody else, including the Neanderthals. So we, we, we are the masters of this world. Um, they didn't know what to do with bonobos. And so they, they tend to say that bonobos are not relevant. But I think they're exactly equally relevant. And um, I'm fascinated by bonobos. And uh, I think the, the intergroup mingling we can explain because it's the females who run the show in the bonobos. And the females want to meet females of the other group. And they sit together and they groom together and the kids play together. There's now observations of food sharing between different groups of bonobos. There's even recently an observation of adoption of orphans by females in this group from that group. Things that in chimpanzees are impossible because in chimpanzees there, there's only hostility between groups. So I think bonobos are extremely interesting. I'm at the moment writing a book on gender because you mentioned gender, yes. and uh, and I'm so glad I have I can work with both. I know both species very well. I can work with both, and and I think we have a little bit of both. For example, male chimpanzees, apart from being very competitive, they're also very bonded. The males are they hang out a lot together and they do things together. That's that's a very human like phenomenon because you, human males too. They're, they're at the same time that they're competitive, they're also friends and and they hang out together. So I think there's all sorts of parallels that you can draw. And I think bonobos enrich that picture enormously. Interesting, yeah. Uh, I mean, since, since you mentioned about uh, anthropologists going for chimps rather than bonobos. So I, I see it, it as a bias, you know, that maybe it's a, I don't think it's a deliberate, maybe I think it's unconscious bias. 
So if we can talk about that, because it's it's really important how we sort of choose our uh, you know favorites, like in yeah. pets, in animals, in in different species, what we want to save, what we don't want to save, uh, for example. Uh, yeah. What do you think? What, what's your observations about this unconscious bias that we have in our society? Yeah, I think anthropology has traditionally be dominated by men who went around the world and what they saw was brotherhoods and initiation rituals and warfare and men doing things, men using tools, all of this. And, and, and they didn't look much at women. Uh, I think they didn't care much for women and they, they had these theories that women were important exchange objects. The, the men ran the groups and they could exchange their daughters or uh, yeah, things like that. Uh, and then anthropology got invaded by a lot of women, a lot of female anthropologists. The same thing happened in, uh, in primatology, but maybe 20 years before the anthropologists. We, we were earlier with that. And then women came in and they started to see different things and they got interested in different stuff. Like, like uh, there are women who are interested in, in the grandmother role. What, what, does the, what do grandmothers do in society? Things like that, which the men had totally ignored. So I think there is a shift in anthropology, but male anthropologists, um, they are still very focused on male dominance, warfare, men using tools, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so, there, yeah, there is a bias there. That's a gender bias. But the other biases, um, so the bias towards violence, uh, being interested in violence, that started after World War II uh, for logical reasons. I think that we were very uh, obsessed by violence at that time. And everything that humans did or animals did was explained in terms of aggression and violence. And that was all the theories we had. And, and it is still so today that if you describe human behavior, you describe bad behavior, like killing each other or whatever, you say they're acting like animals. That, that's what we say. If you describe good behavior, like humans who are nice to each other and help each other and altruistic, uh, that's something we claim for ourselves. The, the good behavior is, is of our making, the bad behavior comes from nature, basically. And, and I've always resented that kind of bias because I think the good stuff that humans do, the, the empathy and the positive emotions also come from our uh, primate sociality. But yeah, that, that is a there are all these biases to deal with. <laughs> in, in there's, there's also racial biases, of course, in that most anthropologists used to be white. So that's another thing. So, so yeah, there's a ton of biases. And, and it is important that we, we punch through, of, through holes in them and that we criticize them because um, not everyone realizes how, how strong these biases can be. Interesting, yes. So at some point of your career, there was a moment, uh, the, the incident that happened with Lewitt uh, mm -hmm. are you are you comfortable talking about it? Maybe you can you can tell us about this incident and how it changed your uh, career itself. Yeah, so um, Light is a was a male a male chimpanzee in a large colony that I worked with as a student, and um, he got killed. He, he got killed by two other males who plotted against him, I think, and they they killed him in the night cage where they would spend time together apart from the colony. In the daytime, they were mixed in with a very large chimpanzee, 25 chimps. And in the daytime, that would never have happened because mama, the alpha female, would have stepped in. The females did not, if the males were politicking and, and confronting each other, they didn't usually mess with that. But if males started to bite each other and make injuries, the females would sometimes step in and stop the whole thing. And so mama would not have accepted this, but this happened in the night cage when the males were away. And apart from killing light, they also castrated him. And so this is, this is actually something we know now from observations in the field. It's not just in the zoo. In the field, we have multiple observations of male chimpanzees, not just killing and attacking each other, but also castrating each other. So I was extremely shocked by this. All the more so because at that time, this kind of violence was not very well known in chips. It was 
we knew a little bit about it uh, from the field, but I had always assumed this could only happen between males who didn't know each other. But these males, they knew each other very well. And so I was, I was very shocked. And, and this was around the time that I moved to the United States um, to, to, to take a position there. And I decided uh, that I needed to focus more on peacemaking tendencies and, and socially positive tendencies than on aggression. Until that time, everyone, including myself, was focused on aggressive behavior in animals. That, that was the big thing. Uh, and this was influenced by Conrad Lawrence, the Nobel Prize winning scientist who had written a book and it was called On Aggression. Uh, and um, I decided I need to have a totally different focus. I'm gonna focus on cooperation and empathy and reconciliation. And I'm gonna focus on the things that hold a society together. Uh, because I, I know that the aggression exists. No one denies it. I'm not going to deny that it exists, but I didn't want it to be my focus. And so that's um, that's how it affected uh, the sort of things that I went to do. Yeah, interesting. So uh, the, the question actually that I was thinking from that story is the do animals grieve? Uh, uh -huh. Do they feel uh, that pain, loss, uh, losing of losing someone? What do you they think? Do. What's your observation? They do. All animals who have strong attachments, and attachment is very common in the animal kingdom, uh, they have loss. And uh, whether you call it grieving or not, they go into a depression. So uh, chimpanzees, for example, um, if someone among them dies, they usually don't eat for a couple of days and they become very silent, which is an unusual situation for them to be silent. Um, if they see the body, nowadays the zoos are, are, have learned that you need to show the body of a dead companion. In the old days, they would just remove it. Uh, if you show the body, they have a very strong reaction to that. It's, it's as if they know that this is irreversible. For so, some reason, I don't know how, they realize that someone is dead and gets cold it is an irreversible process. They don't expect this individual back. So, so they have some understanding of mortality. I always say they have an understanding of the mortality of others. I'm not sure. We don't have evidence that they know about their own mortality or that they worry about it, but certainly of others. And so they have a very strong reaction and uh, grieving, yes, they, 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 these attachments, for example, if a mother chimpanzee loses her baby, she will carry the dead body around for weeks sometimes. Same has been observed in, in orcas, you know, killer whales. A, a female lost her calf and she dragged it around in the ocean for weeks. And so the, it's very hard to lose these attachments once they are there. And yeah, there, I think there are grieving processes, very similar to those in humans. Yeah. So, so if we see basically all these examples, they shows the importance of those social connections. Um, uh, which generally they fade away when, uh, especially nowadays when we are, you know, dealing with all the social media and everything where uh, we may not connect with the person who is sitting next to us, but we may connect with the person who is sitting miles away. Um, what, so here, I think one more factor which plays an important role is that consciousness, being aware of yourself uh, and of the others, and also the sentience. So you have those, you have defined both the terms in your last book. You've, I, I, could, I could feel that there is a lot of new information coming in, in, this, uh, this, in, in, in this field as well, like connecting uh, consciousness with the emotions. Um, so, so how do you define sentience and consciousness? Mm. Consciousness, we really don't know. Uh, I, I always feel that consciousness was invented by people who before that time used the word soul or something like humans have souls and animals have no souls. No one knew what a soul was, so it was hard to disprove this position. And the same is true with consciousness. People now say we are conscious, but animals are not. And I don't know has it, but no one tells me what it is. So consciousness is so hard to define. But I do feel that there are certain things 
<laughs> there are certain things that we humans cannot do without being conscious. And, and, and that's the stuff that we should look for. So for example, you cannot plan a party for tomorrow for your friends without being conscious of it. You, you need to decide who you're going to invite, at what time, what they're going to drink, uh, what kind of music you're going to play. You have to take a lot of decisions and you do that consciously. So if planning like that takes consciousness, then we can look for planning in animals. And, and we do experiments, for example, people do experiments where they, they give a chimpanzee uh, a tool that they can use immediately for a small reward and another tool that they, that they, can, they have learned that they can use tomorrow for a much bigger reward. What does the chimpanzee do? He, he, he doesn't touch the, the first tool. He, he waits with the second tool in hand for the next day. So, so we, we do these planning experiments. And since chimpanzees can plan ahead, and some birds can do that, and orangutans can do that, and elephants can do that. So since some, some animals can do that, they must have consciousness. Because we cannot do these things without consciousness. Why would they be able to do it in a different way? That would be sort of ridiculous. So uh, I think there are this kind of indirect indications of consciousness in other species. And sentience is a much broader issue. Sentience is, sentience is that you experience states like pain and pleasure. That those would be the most basic states, pain and pleasure. And uh, yeah, people have debated to death whether fish have pain, for example. But I think we now have settled on the idea that, that all vertebrates at least, but maybe also invertebrates like insects, uh, have, are sentient, that, that they have, that they're experiencing internal states. Interesting. Uh, if, if we think about that, of course, the other species, they are also sentient, uh, then also, uh, you know, it brings us to another topic called welfare, animal welfare, or you know the other species welfare. And what I see that you have an interesting take on the roles of zoos in, in the society. Uh, so, so what do you think? Do we need zoos? I mean, of course, there are people pro uh, protesting against uh, animals in captivity, etc. Uh, what do you think about it? I think we, we, we are so urbanized now, the human species, that, that we need that connection. So, so, so the zoos in the US, for example, I don't know how it is in other countries, but in the US before the pandemic, the zoos would attract per year 175 million people per year. That means lots of people go to zoos. And I know many of these people just go there to eat ice creams and walk around with their children. I know that. But in the meantime, they get a little bit of education and they see these animals and they're interested in these animals. And I think seeing a, an elephant up close is different from seeing one on TV. So I do feel zoos play a role in making us more aware of the richness of the natural environment around us. And good zoos treat these animals well. They, they really take good care of these animals. There are, of course, many bad zoos and I have no patience with bad zoos that lock a tiger in a small cage and that's all they do. Uh, I, I don't care for that kind of zoos. But the good zoos, they, they generate money also that can be used partly for the zoo itself, but also partly for conservation projects and education projects. And so I think zoos have an important role to play, have always played an important role in making people aware of the animal kingdom. Interesting. And so from, of, of course, when we are talking about animals in captivity, then uh, we will have to talk about the animals in captivity for the research. And mm -hmm. uh, I also followed Chimp Heaven, which is, uh, I think it's brilliant uh, project. Maybe you can just tell us about uh, this also. Uh, yeah, I've been on the board of Chimp Haven for, I think, more than 20 years or s since the beginning almost. And Chimp Haven is an organization in the US that receives ex lab chimps because chimpanzees are barely used anymore in biomedical studies. That's completely over. Uh, and uh, that mean, and we're not breeding with chimpanzees anymore. So, so young chimps are basically not available anymore. And uh, we have all these retired chimpanzees basically uh, that go to Chimp Haven 
And Simphaven is a beautiful facility, outdoor facility with large islands on which we then release these apes who come from laboratories. A chimpanzee can live up to 60 years, most of them up to 50 years. So, so they have a long life still ahead of them. And uh, chimpanzees are ne never terminated. With, with, for example, with rats or something, people would just kill them if they don't need them anymore. That, that has never happened with chimps and will never happen with chimps. So uh, chimps are moved to a retirement facility. And in this case, a beautiful one. I, I'm, I'm really proud of Chimp Haven because it's outdoor forests. And these chimps who have lived in a small cage then have to adjust to social life and adjust to a, a much richer environment. And, and they do. It's, it's a remarkable how well they can adjust to this new environment. Indeed, it was so fascinating to see their reaction once they reached there. Um, but then also, what do you think about animals that they are in dairy, you know, they, they be, or in farms, you know, uh, which we are using, yeah. of course, for the meat? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Agri agricultural animals, is actually, the, that's the vast majority. So billions and billions of animals are in the meat industry. Because animals in research and animals in zoos, those are small numbers. And animals in zoos, I think in a good zoo, they, they live in paradise compared to the way we keep pigs, for example, uh, that are raised for meat. So, so people may focus on zoos, but zoos are not the big problem. The big problem is the meat industry. And uh, I think that I, I'm personally not against eating meat, maybe because I'm a biologist and in, we, we know how many animals eat meat, um, but I'm against the poor treatment that these animals receive. I think we can do a much better job and, and I'm waiting for the day, I'm praying for the day, so to speak, that we uh, don't need to raise animals like this anymore because there is of course an alternative meat industry coming up and, uh, and uh, an artificial meat industry is coming up and, and it's gonna be successful, I'm sure, because it has ec ecological advantages and moral advantages. So it has to be successful. So that's gonna come. But in the meantime, in the 20 years or so that we still have the meat industry and still eat uh, animal meat this way, we need to do a much better job at, at treating these, how we treat these animals and, and give them more space and more opportunities and a, a more enriched life and so on. And, and reduce in the meantime, that's only possible if we reduce the meat consumption. So, so yeah, that's sort of the measures we need to take in the meantime until we have, um, we have artificial meats that satisfy everybody. Yeah, so you also have one comment, uh, like if you are born as an orangutan today, whether you'd prefer Borneo or uh, these zoos. And yeah, that, that, that relates to the situation in the wild. So if people complain about zoos, I always think, well, there are animals at zoos who would not survive in the wild who, who, because the wild doesn't exist anymore for them. And orangutan is a good example. In the last 20 years, 100,000 orangutans have disappeared from Borneo, the island in, in Indonesia. That's about half the population of orangutans has disappeared in 20 years. They are being shot by farmers. Uh, their forests are being burned down. And so if I were an orangutan today, you would ask me, do you want to be in Borneo or in the zoo? Uh, I, I think I would choose the zoo. I would be treated much better there than uh, in the wild. And so um, when people object to zoos, you always have to keep that in mind, is that the wild is not a paradise. Uh, the wild can be a very difficult situation. And, and it is already very difficult normally. And, but we are making now our human influence is making it sometimes horrible. Yes. Uh, actually, why I mentioned it now is because today is International Orangutan Day. So okay. I would, I would uh, of course, urge all the people who are participating here, uh, they can spread a message about it and also talk about the condition of or orangutans and see how, how you can support their survival. Um, now maybe we can also move on for the questions. Um, for next 10, 15 minutes, we take a few questions and then uh, we, we can hang up. So probably, so guys, just raise up your hand and then I can just call you by name.
Don't be shy. So exactly. Meanwhile, I have uh, five questions in the chat, but I'll, okay. I'll see how many we can take now. Um, she's saying thank you for wonderful and interesting talk. It was really nice to know how close we are to the other primates. So the first question is any incidences of the concern for nature or other species in chimps? Concern for other, for other species. Well, in chimps, um, I'm not sure, but we, we have a few observations of animals helping other, other species. Like for example, in dolphins helping human swimmers, uh, whales helping other whale species against um, orcas, which are killer whales, which are pred predators. So, so yes, we do have sometimes observations of animals helping each other probably in reaction to distress calls that they that are maybe similar to the distress calls of their own species and they react to it at that point. So uh, it does happen, but it's not common. So, so you have to think empathy and altruism evolved to help your, your friends and your family, basically. That's how it evolved and why it exists in us and in other species. And applying that same tendency to completely different species, like we sometimes do when we empathize with a dog or whatever we do, uh, is, is not typical. That's not what empathy evolved for. And, it, and it, it does happen, but it's not typical. Yes, and the, the next question is, if there is any equivalent of art or music uh, in other species, in chimps, for example. Yeah. Well, music, of course, in the birds, in the birds, you find lots Art, of music. Yes. And yeah. actually, Mozart wrote a whole symphony based on the song of his bird. And then, and then the musicologists, they didn't like that suggestion because, they, because Mozart had written down in his notebook how his bird sang. And he used that as an inspiration for a whole symphony. So yeah, um, uh, mute, there's a lot of research now on music abilities in other animals, where they see if they can follow a rhythm, can they produce a rhythm? Uh, can they understand notes? Uh, how do they react to uh, to Western music or any other music? There's a famous experiment that was done with starlings, I believe, uh, who were in a cage and they could sit on one perch or the other perch. And, and uh, if they would sit on this perch, Mozart would play. And if they would sit on this perch, Schoenberg would play. And the birds preferred Mozart over Schoenberg. So that kind of experiment is being done. Uh, we did experiments with our chimps because it was said that chimps were indifferent to, to Western music or to, uh, to uh, human music. And we played, I think, Indian music and Western music and Japanese rhythm sections. Uh, and the chimps preferred the Indian music over other types. Mm -hmm. So, so we, we've, we've done that kind of stuff and people are exploring the music abilities of animals. But their own production, like chimpanzees will drum on trees and they have a good sense of rhythm sometimes. So they, uh, that kind of things is produced sometimes. But of course, uh, chimpanzees are not very melodious in their utterances. So uh, beautiful music doesn't come out of them. Hmm. Very interesting. So there is another question from Devendra Mohan Mathu. And please turn on your mic and ask the question. Sir, my question is, are you able to hear me? I yes, can we can hear you. I think I can hear you, yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my question is, how an animal uh, feels when in a slaughterhouse, when other animal of his type is being slaughtered for the purpose of meat there? When an animal, the other animal needs what? Yeah. Uh, how uh, one uh, feels? What are the emotions experienced by a, an animal who is, uh, who is who, uh, who sees an animal, other animal of his kind, slaughtered in the uh, slaughterhouse before him? So, so you're asking how they recognize what, what the other one needs and, and what the other one feels, so to speak? Yeah. In, yeah. in the slaughterhouse. 
Oh, in a slaughterhouse. In the slaughterhouse, the animals who are watching that they are, uh, you know, colleagues ah. basically that they are getting slaughtered. How how do they feel, or oh, if there, there are any observations? I think they're horrified. So um, yeah, so the the. There is a, a, a woman scientist, Temple Grandin. I don't know if you know her, but she, she um, does work on, uh, studies slaughterhouses and how to, how to treat animals. And she, I think she emphasizes that it's not good to show them uh, what's going on there. Uh, and she, she tries to make the slaughterhouses more humane, so to speak. Uh, even though that's of course a bit of a struggle to make, to make a place where you kill them, uh, a humane place, but uh, certainly there are improvements possible. But I think um, if they would directly observe what happens, they would be extremely affected. Uh, that's my guess. Yes. In, in this country, it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And there is another question from Neha. If you can please turn on your mic. Um. First of all, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'll just like uh, keep it short. Uh, the question is like these ba basic moral, moral traits that you describe, like fairness, reciprocity, empathy, cooperation. So according to your observations, I can say like science show that these traits are shared between primates. So one point of view is that an individual may show these basic traits out of self-interest, uh, like for example, showing its power or holding a position. So he's showing these traits because of, you know, his his these uh, selfish interests. So question is, if there are any observations uh, that show that there can be selfless interest in expressing these traits among the primates. Yeah, yeah. So in biology, we always assume that if a characteristic exists it must be doing something positive for you mm -hmm. and your immediate, your immediate relatives, maybe mm -hmm. your offspring and things like that. Uh, and that's how they evolve. But once they exist, they can be expanded. So for example, human empathy evolved clearly to take care of your family and your immediate relatives, mm -hmm. um, but it can be applied to a stranded whale. We, we, we push the stranded whale back into the ocean, which is empathy, which is really an expansion of the original function of empathy. So, so it's very common for characteristics to evolve for one reason and then be used for other reasons than, and to expand their use. And I think that happens. Now mm -hmm. uh, in chimpanzees, we sometimes see altruistic acts that, um, that are very risky. For example, if a chimpanzee in the wild is attacked by a leopard, which is very dangerous for them, mm -hmm. and, and they have a special scream when that happens, others may come over to chase the leopard off, which is a very risky business. They should be staying away uh, as far as they can from the situation, but no, they're gonna go help the other one. And, and so uh, chimpanzees also have been known to save others who are drowning. Uh, to pull them out of the water. They, they cannot swim. And so it's very dangerous for them to get close to the water. Uh, and, and so they, they perform high risk acts of altruism. And whether these are ever repaid to them, uh, that's not clear. We, we don't know if they, how, how that's gonna be repaid and if that's gonna happen. And they, at the moment that they perform these acts, of course, they don't know if they are ever gonna get repaid for this behavior. So there is high risk altruism. And so I would say once these tendencies exist to help others, uh, they are sometimes applied in circumstances that you could call highly altruistic. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's interesting to know. And um, if, if the time allows, can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so uh, this, is, this has nothing to do with these uh, moral traits, but like a very uh, different question related to dreams. So are there also any evidence that uh, chimps or other primates, they have these dreams that they, you know, um, experience? Or maybe in the animals that were first kept in captivity and they show some kind of traits of these, having some dreams, traumatic, from their past traumatic experiences? 
You mean, uh, can they be traumatized and yeah. for forever? Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we actually do research on bonobos in, in a sanctuary. Mm-hmm. And the, in the sanctuary in Africa. And the reason they are in the sanctuary is because of the bushmeat hunting in Africa. So their mothers are shot, are killed, and mm-hmm. then the babies end up in the sanctuary and are raised by humans and, and grow into adults. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the traumatized orphans in these sanctuaries, they, they differ in behavior from regular bonobos. They, they have trouble with empathy, for example. They have less empathy for others. Uh, and th- this is also known for traumatized human orphans, because there are studies of human orphanages in Romania, for example, and these children have a lot of emotional problems. So yes, permanent trauma can occur in the apes. And um, the good news of, of the bonobos in the sanctuary in Africa is that they get over it. After a couple of years, they grow out of it. So, mm-hmm. so they do better after a while. Um, but yeah, uh, trauma, emotional trauma is actually quite common in many animals. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so the next question we have from Dr. Manu Sharma. He says, thank you for the insightful webinar. I would like to know uh, Professor De- DeVos' thoughts on possible evolutionary significance of the establishment of hierarchy in primates. Also, whether chimps and other primates engage in lying or deception or concealment. Yeah, they do. They actually do. So uh, they, of course, they cannot lie verbally. They do not do that, but they can send false signals. And so uh, you may have, for example, an an old female who had a fight with a young female and, and couldn't catch the young female to punish her. She may try to invite the young female uh, with very friendly behavior for a reconciliation and then if, if the young female gets close, all of a sudden try to grab her and, and still bite her or, or punish her. Uh, of course, you cannot do that kind of deceptions very often because you get a reputation that you're not trustworthy and uh, deception is for that reason rare. Also in humans, someone who lies all the time, you're not gonna believe him next time. And so you cannot lie too much. If you do, then um, no one's gonna wanna deal with you. Yeah. The next question is from Anna. Thanks a lot for the interesting discussion. And the question is, humans are close relatives of apes. How scientists can be unbiased when they study them? Uh, To what extent do our preconceptions influence our interpretations and narratives about observations in animals? Yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard to, uh, it's, it's already hard to study humans, of course, I, I'm surrounded by psychologists who study our own species. And I think if it's our own species, it's almost impossible to be objective and neutral and because we, we are part of this society and so we're very much involved. But if you get to animals close to us, like chimps and bonobos, you have that same issue is they are so similar to us in so many ways that it is hard to keep your distance. And the way we scientists do that is by having protocols of how we collect information on them. So we, we're not just sitting there and watching them. We, we collect systematic observations. We have a list of, let's say, 50 behaviors that we define, like let's say grooming and sex and play and aggression. And we have all these behaviors, maybe 50 behaviors. And we have a digital device in which we type in who does what to whom at what point. And then later we do analysis on the computer to count are males more aggressive than females or do males play more than females or whatever the the counting is that we do. And so we we overcome this problem of closeness a little bit by uh, having data collection techniques that are quite objective. So so that's how we manage that. Yeah, and I also remember that the, the, for example, the capuchin monkey uh, experiment that you guys did and you mentioned that you did it like 25 times or uh, you know, 50 times or something to so to to just repeat it like so many times to uh, yeah. uh, to get this the same observation. I think that's also critical. Yeah. So when when you do an obs- uh, an experiment like that, what you see on on the on the internet is a video clip of one minute. Exactly. But the study the study itself takes like two years because you do many different monkeys with many different circumstances, and so. Uh, 
what you see is not really what the study is. The study is much more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that we are going a bit overboard, but I think we have three more people. So three more questions, if mm -hmm. we can take, and then probably we can close the session. So the next question is from Rima. Uh, if you can please ask the question. Hello, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, my question is about the uh, some behavior problem. I, I just rescued a German shepherd. So uh, he's like in just a week, he was so much overprotective and possessive about, about me. He's not allowing anyone near me and especially humans. So I just want to ask, what can I do with that behavior? How can I control him? And what's the reason behind this? Because we have worked upon the behavior of all these species. So it's really very helpful for me as I deal with uh, these babies. Uh, I think, is there any trauma behind the, uh, that so, whatever so, the... So, so what kind of animal is this? It, it's a dog. It's a German shepherd oh, a dog. dog. Okay, yeah. okay. So, um, yeah, we do studies actually on uh, jealousy because that's one of the emotions that I think uh, we recognize in other animals who are jealous of contacts uh, and protect um, their contacts. I, I don't know what you can do about it. Um, the, that's going to be very tough um, because um, the dog is probably getting very attached to you and as a result doesn't want anybody else to get attached to you uh, and to be close to you. And uh, sometimes this can be overcome by exposure. Just so if, if you have a friend um, who comes over regularly uh, and can win over the heart of your dog, then maybe that's a possibility. Uh, but these things are very hard to overcome. And I know these, these tendencies are very strong. Thank you. And the next question is from Sarah. Please, Sarah. I have a question about the adoption because I was really impressed from the story of Gorilla and Rosie from the chimpanzee politic books. And um, basically, I want to know if exists a parallelism between adoption in humans and chimps because you adopt a child in humans because it, to compensate maybe a lack that you have, an infertility issue or uh, a child loss. But uh, I want to know if it's the same for chimps. Yeah, I think adoption is actually very common in the animal kingdom, also spontaneously sometimes. So of course, yeah. the, case that, the case that you mentioned with Roche is something that we arranged uh, knowing that um, this female would accept but in the wild, sometimes adoptions occur because a female dies, so the mother dies, and all of a sudden you have a baby chimp running around, uh, and, and even males adopt. So, so females, females rarely adopt um, when they have their own child because they cannot carry two children. It's just impossible for them in the wild, in the, in the trees and everything. So when they have their own child, they cannot adopt somebody else's child. And males sometimes, for that reason, I think males sometimes adopt. And so there are reports of fully adult males who adopt a orphan uh, sometimes for a couple of years. So not just for a few weeks, but for a couple of years and really take care of them. I think it's very interesting that males have this capacity, which they normally never express uh, because normally they don't do much with babies, but in this case they do. And so adoption occurs and, and sometimes it's a full-blown adoption, like the case with Roche, uh, that female really took care of her and uh, didn't make a distinction. I think at some point they don't make a distinction anymore between an adopted child and their own and child. The okay. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So the last question for today's session is uh, from Shreytama. So Franz, it was an amazing experience to watch your this discussion and also reading your book. It's like amazing. Uh, so my question is something related to what Jitender uh, discussed before about faith. So it is more about imagination. So as humans, we imagine a lot, like we imagine almost everything. So like you tell me that, okay, you stay a virgin for this life and once you die, you will go to heaven and you will get all the happiness there. Or if you suffer in this life, 
once you die you go to heaven and you get all the happiness so do you think this type of imagination is possible by the other age yeah a belief in the afterlife or reincarnation or whatever it is i think that's a typical human saying uh-huh. we have no evidence of course how do how would i know i i i cannot talk with my chimps and i cannot ask them about it uh, mm-hmm. but as i said I, i i doubt that they have a sense of mortality so i do think they recognize the death the death of others and they react strongly to it mm-hmm. but whether they understand that they will die one day uh, there's an interesting story by a, a, a japanese scientist who had a in captivity a chimpanzee male who was very sick who was basically dying uh and 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 the male remained playful until the last uh, the last minute so to speak he remained playful he was a playful character and and this japanese scientist said well he 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 didn't seem to realize that his life was coming to an end he did because otherwise you, you're not going to be playful if you think you're going to die the next minute so he yeah, he course. thought that this male male had no understanding of the end of life and so I have my doubts about the sense of mortality in animals uh, mm-hmm. although I do think they understand the death of others yeah okay thank you so much that was a fascinating story thank you thank you perfect so thank you so much uh, for the session for answering all the questions and you've already mentioned about uh, your upcoming book we are looking forward mm-hmm. to it do you want to uh, tell us a little bit more about it uh, the book, the book title and- Yeah the book title is different so that's the main title different the subtitle is uh, gender uh, through the eyes of a primatologist and it's about sex differences but also sex similarities uh, so for example um, uh, what what we talked about is i i mentioned that for me uh, power and dominance are different things yes some some species of primates are are male dominated but there's lots of power in the females and so i discussed that kind of issues and and the different tendencies of males and females and also exceptions to the gender binary in the sense that we we do have always individuals who are not fitting so easily with the male and female uh, distinction so, so for example we had a female uh, in chimpanzee named donna who who was a female but she acted like a male she had the body of a male and the hair of a male and she acted like one and so she she might be i cannot know that for sure but she she might be identifying as a male as well so so it's interesting to have that kind of comparisons and so yes my next book is on uh, gender in in the primates perfect so we are looking forward to it and thank you again uh, to join the session thank you and thank you everyone else to join I hope yeah, you enjoyed it. Bye bye. Bye. bye.